don't really know how or why, he came to exert enormous influence on Galba, even though the two could not have been more different. Galba hated bribes. Vinius, it was said, would do anything for one. Along with Vinius, there was Cornelius Laco, who served as Galba's legal advisor. In contrast to Vinius, he was an honest, if lazy, man. When Galba ascended to the throne, he would appoint Laco as Praetorian Prefect, even though Laco had no military or administrative experience. Rounding out the trio was a freedman advisor named Icelus, who was in Rome when Nero committed suicide, and was the one who brought the news to Galba. For making the trip from Rome to Spain in just seven days, Galba elevated Icelus to equestrian status. The former slave would then spend the rest of his short life accumulating the money his new rank required, like Vinius, by any means necessary. The three men were, of course, rivals for Galba's favor and attention, but they transcended their own bickering when it came to keeping others locked out of the inner circle. If you wanted to talk to Galba, you had to go through one of them. This was why the neighboring governor of Lusitania was forced to form a short-lived alliance with Vinius in an attempt to secure his own adoption by the childless Galba. Everyone knew that the old man would be dead soon, so as soon as Galba came to power, it was already time to start planning for the future. Marcus Salvius Otho, the young governor in question, was convinced that he could convince Galba to adopt him so that when the old man died, he, Otho, would become emperor. After all, an astrologer had told him that it would be so. He was born in 32 BC, making him by far the youngest of the four emperors. He was descended from Etruscan nobility, but his family had only reached senatorial status with his grandfather, who did so after the Augusta took a liking to him. As a result of this connection, Otho's father became close to Tiberius, and the family thrived under the Julio-Claudian dynasty. Otho himself was only five years older than Nero, and when the teenager became emperor in 54, Otho was right there by his side and quickly became one of Nero's most prominent drinking buddies. Together, they would spend their nights blowing through money, alcohol, and women, and Otho earned a reputation as a ringleader of the decadent proceedings. But in 58, the two had a falling out over Otho's wife, Papia Sabina. As I said last week, it is entirely possible that Papia only targeted Otho to get close to Nero, but it has also been suggested that Nero and Otho had arranged the match to put Papia on hold for Nero until the emperor could figure out how to rid himself of his wife, Claudia Octavia. If this latter version is true, then it seems that when it came time to hand Papia over, Otho had had a change of heart. However it happened, though, Papia went over to Nero, and Otho wasn't happy about it. To deal with this problem, Nero appointed Otho governor of Lusitania, which on the one hand was a fat promotion, as Otho had only served previously as a quaestor and didn't qualify for the post, but on the other hand, it was obviously meant to exile him from Rome. Despite everyone's expectations that this drunken gadabout would prove to be a disaster, Otho emerged as a competent administrator, and though he no doubt longed to get out of his backwater province, he seemed to have served his time conscientiously. But when his neighbor Galba declared his intention to take control of the empire, though, Otho seized on his chance not only to revenge himself upon Nero, but also to free himself from exile. He immediately sent word to Galba that the treasury of Lusitania was at the old man's disposal, an announcement Otho hoped would demonstrate some unique level of commitment to the cause, but apparently Galba received the news blandly, stating in essence, well, of course your treasury is at my disposal, I don't need you to tell me that. Undeterred, Otho also sent along some of his better slaves, who were worthy of service to a new emperor. But they were greeted with disdain by the frugal Galba, who disapproved of the extravagance that was beginning to affix itself to his entourage. But Otho convinced himself that he had really gotten on Galba's good side with all of these gestures, and set about trying to figure a way to convince Galba to adopt him, so that when Galba died, Otho could rise up in his place. He was especially convinced that this was his destiny, because during his time in Lusitania, he had grown enamored with an astrologer who predicted soon after the news came of Nero's death that Otho would become emperor soon. It was Otho himself, though, who made the leap to the belief that that meant Galba would be adopting him. 
In his excellent 69 AD, The Year of Four Emperors, which I'll be drawing on heavily for the next few episodes, Gwyn Morgan points out that if this was his plan, then Otho's power for self-deception was unparalleled. The taciturn and conservative Galba had not risen in revolt against Nero just to make sure one of Nero's drinking buddies wound up on the throne. But Otho was sure he was on the right track and arranged a deal to marry Vinius' daughter in exchange for Vinius' support on the issue of adoption. And in fact, Otho was so convinced that Galba was going to adopt him that when he learned Galba had chosen the more stable Lucius Calpurnius Piso instead, a blindsided Otho flew into such a rage that he assassinated Galba less than a week later. But we'll get into all that in a bit. So, so far, we have here two men, one at the end of his career, and convinced that it was not just his duty, but his right to assume the title of Caesar, and one who had barely started his career, but was crazy ambitious enough to believe that he was destined to don the purple. Having covered Vespasian, the man who would outlast them both last week, though I did botch his birth date, he was born in 980, not 17, and his son Titus was born in 39, not 41, thanks to alert listener Sarah for catching that. We are left then with just one more emperor to introduce, the third leg of the relay, which as students of track and field will tell you, is always the slowest member of the team. And I don't just mean that figuratively, though I do mean it figuratively. I also mean that literally, Aulus Vitellius was probably one of the slowest men to ever ascend to the throne. Vitellius was born in 15 AD, to a family either descended from ancient Latin nobility or descended from common stock nobodies, depending on whether you are talking to a supporter or an opponent of the man. His father was a prominent official who served with distinction under Tiberius, Caligula, and Claudius. Such was the esteem in which the elder Vitellius was held that when he died, Claudius honored him with a state funeral. Not much is known about the early years of young Aulus, except for the rumor that when he was born, the horoscope taken on the occasion of his birth so horrified his parents that Vitellius' father wound up actually trying to hinder his son's career for his own sake and Rome's. The alleged horoscope stated that if Vitellius was ever put in charge of an army, that disaster would ensue. This prophecy hung over Vitellius' head, and as I said, his father used what influence he had to make sure that his son was always posted to non-military provinces. When Galba appointed him to command the legions of the Lower Rhine, it would prove to be the first military posting of his career. Did disaster ensue? Well, the legions under his command revolted against their emperor, won, then lost a civil war, and Vitellius himself was dead just a year after assuming the post, so yeah, I would call that disastrous for pretty much everyone involved. But up until that point, the affable and non-threatening Vitellius managed to thrive in a political environment where talent was viewed with suspicion, and he rose to the rank of consul during the reign of Claudius in 48 AD. More than a decade later, he was named proconsul to Africa by Nero in either 60 or 61. Throughout his career, Vitellius earned a reputation for good-natured laziness, unambitious but honest administration, but above all, a massive appetite for all the finer things in life, usually stuffing four full meals into a day. His one major vice, beyond gambling, was that he would use the men at his disposal to go out into the wide world and bring home delicacies from across the empire. But though he was not cut from the same vigorous and athletic mold that perhaps his forebears were, Vitellius was always well liked by his subordinates wherever he went. The stories of his arrival on the Rhine after the ascension of Galba are peppered with accounts of his shaking hands with mule drivers, learning the names of slaves, and generally showing interest in all the various nobodies under his command. In short, Vitellius was a classic player's coach, the kind of man you love to play for, even if he wasn't strict enough to get the most out of your team. Discipline was lax, and parties were frequent. There could not have been a stronger contrast to the strict and humorless Galba than the flush-cheeked and jovial Vitellius, and the troops along the Rhine did not miss the distinction. On the one hand, there was the hated Galba, who had beaten them and worked them and driven them like pack animals. And on the other hand was beloved Vitellius, who joined in their dice games, 
let them off the hook if their uniforms were out of order, and shared his table with anyone who wanted to have some good food. So on January 1, 69 AD, when the legions across the empire were supposed to renew their oaths to serve the new emperor Galba, the legions on the Rhine refused. They were done with Galba. Vitellius was their man, and they declared him emperor by acclaim. The man most shocked to find Vitellius suddenly leading a full-blown revolt against Galba? Vitellius himself, of course. When I return from the break, we'll dive into the guts of the year of the four emperors. Galba will ascend to the throne, but as Tacitus says, everyone agreed that Galba would make an excellent emperor until he actually became emperor. His short and unpopular reign will be cut short when Otho assassinates him in January of 69. Otho will wind up committing suicide in April after suffering defeat in northern Italy at the hands of Vitellius' invading Rhine legions. Vitellius himself will only last until December. In over his head and ready to bow to the more formidable Vespasian, he will be unnecessarily murdered by Flavian partisans just before the arrival of the new year. Vespasian will then emerge into 70 AD as the founder of a new imperial dynasty. Next week, though, I'm going to pause our forward progress, and in honor of my own fast-approaching nuptials, we'll dedicate an episode to Roman wedding customs. And if there's not enough material to cover a whole episode, maybe I'll just ramble on a bit about Roman family life. Should be fun, so join me next week for A History of Rome Wedding. Welcome to the History of Rome, Episode 69, A History of Rome Wedding. So the History of Rome is getting married in a week and a half, and to celebrate, today we're going to set aside the steady march of history and do a short episode focused on Roman wedding customs. Remember also that after today, we'll be going off the air for four weeks while we here at the History of Rome do the thing where we get married and then do the thing where we move to Austin, Texas. When we come back, though, we'll do the Rock'em Sock'em drama of 69 AD, and then move into the Flavian dynasty on our way to the Five Good Emperors, the decline phase into the crisis of the 3rd century, and the surprising comeback led by Diocletian and confirmed by Constantine. Lots and lots still to come, so please stay tuned. Today, though, we've got weddings on the brain. Yesterday, we finalized the floral arrangements, picked up my suit from the tailor, scrambled for a workable solution to the wedding cake issue, and, gulp, went down to the giant brick building to pay for and sign an official wedding certificate that will formally make us husband and wife once it's signed by the state-sanctioned officiant who will perform the wedding ceremony. As it turns out, weddings are a confusing amalgam of emotion, tradition, and bureaucratic legalese. If that doesn't sound like the Romans, well, I don't know what does. It goes without saying that we have them to thank for a lot of what we all have to put up with when it's time to get married. As an institution, marriage dates back into prehistory and was codified as a legal relationship as early as Hammurabi's Code in the 1700s BC. There are competing theories about where the institution came from and why it persists, and I'm basically not going to touch any of that with a 10-foot pole. But I'm just going to say that by the time the Romans came onto the scene, marriage was a well-established rock upon which society was based. It was the manner by which property, wealth, rights, responsibilities, and alliances were transferred from 